you choose to work on Mexican and Argentinian cultural policies? Um, this book is the result of my PhD thesis, uh, a PhD thesis in political science. And uh, before studying political science, I studied anthropology in Mexico, where I lived for six years. I was therefore very familiar with uh, the Mexican culture, especially its Indian traditional and popular cultures. So that's why I chose Mexico. And the interest in cultural policy came to me during my undergraduate research when I interviewed French cultural attaches in Mexico. I found their work uh, fascinating. And for my thesis, I wanted to see um, what Mexicans were doing to promote their culture abroad, particularly in the context of the celebration of the bicentenary of Mexico's independence. Uh, while interviewing uh, at the Secretariat of uh, in External Relations, I saw that several partnerships were being launched with Argentina, which was also celebrating its independence in 2010. I found the relationship between the two countries interesting because the Mexicans I spoke to about Argentina did so with a mix of uh, rejection and admiration. Uh, many Argentines emigrated to Mexico after the 2001 crisis. So I was very keen to discover this country. At the same time, I found it interesting, but also annoying that when I said I was working on Argentina cultural policy, I was often told but there is no cultural policy in Argentina. Indeed, uh, Mexican cultural policy is considered a model in Latin America. The Mexican state implemented public action in culture from the early 20th century. In contrast, due to its complicated political history, culture in Argentina was supported, then censored, censored, then supported from the 30s to the 80s. So that's why I decided to work on the processes of institutionalization of uh, the cultural policy. Uh, Elodie, then uh, you talk about the uh, institutionalization process. That's one of the chapters in your book, isn't it? Can you tell us more about your theoretical framework? Yes, uh, the processes of institutionalization have long been my theoretical obsession. Uh, by studying uh, Argentina's in, and Mexico's cultural policies, I think that the process of institutionalization was triggered by the convergence of three phenomena. The first one is uh, policy planning. Uh, the planning is elaborated in documents, the objectives, definitions, and solutions presented in these documents are based on the problems and solutions constructed by different type of actors uh, as politicians, uh, administrators in the ministries, but also intellectuals and artists, trade unionists or members of pressure groups. All their opinions uh, and proposals are collected in forums. For example, in Mexico, the party that governed the country in most of the 20th uh, century finance large colloquiums uh, in which it invited great writers and artists, hundreds of them. In one of these political forums, uh, organized before a presidential campaign, a poet close to Octavio Paz took Paz's proposition to create a North Council in Mexico, like in the UK, and a fund like the National Endowment for the Art in the US. When elected president, uh, Carlos Salinas wanted the Nobel Prize winner Octavio Paz to be his minister of culture, like uh, President de Gaulle with the poet André Malraux. But Paz refused because he considered that only developed uh, or authoritarian countries should have ministries of culture. And this point of view was dominant for a long time in Mexico and the Conaculta and the Fonca were created. Since Salinas' presidency, the cultural policy planning has been carried out automatically 
every six years in Mexico. As soon as a new president is elected, his cultural planning document is very expected. In Argentina, however, this is not automatic at all. It depends on the goodwill of the Secretary of Culture. Some do it, but most do not. And this is one of the points that explains, in my opinion, why Argentina's cultural policies is less institutionalized. This lack of planning means that the Secretary of Culture is, above everything else, keen to leave his or her mark. They often want to change everything their predecessor has done, even when they are in the same government. Uh, so there is a lot of instability in this policy. Uh, the second factor in my uh, theoretical uh, uh, framework that allows a cultural policy to consolidate or to become institutionalized is uh, the existence of a consolidated le legal uh, framework. What does this mean? Um, the legal framework is made of laws, decrees, instruments that are organized. In Argentina, cultural actors have been trying for several years to have a framework law adopted a law that organized the countess law that exists, uh, for instance, in cinema, theater, heritage. And the last attempt was seven years ago with the federal law of culture, La Ley Federal de Culturas, but the project could not succeed, even though it was supported by hundreds of artists, um, intellectuals, and the government. However, Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner creates a Ministry of Culture but through a presidential decree. A presidential decree can easily be changed. Uh, and we saw that with uh, Mauricio Macri's government abolished the ministry just four years after its creation. On the other hand, in Mexico, the process of institutionalization is stronger. A framework law was adopted in 2017 after a federal consultative process and a ministry of, uh, of culture was created two years before the ministry has remained even after the changeover uh, after a socio-economic crisis this brings me to my last factor of institutionalization of a cultural policy the existence of a ministry of culture uh, a Ministry of Culture is important because it allows uh, the policy to have, to have its own budget line. Not a small budget uh, allocated by the Ministry of Education. Having a ministry also allowed the cultural policymaker to attend cabinet meetings, but also to discuss and defend uh, the policy and its budget uh, with the highest level of government. Moreover, a uh, ministry allows the emergence of constituencies, the constituencies like those stories by Paul Pearson in the US. These constituencies the, develop around the policy and defend uh, this policy in parliaments and sometimes even in the streets. A ministry also allows its members to create a specific way of thinking and acting. Uh, to build an identity of uh, their own and to defend their ministry, its budget and its policy. So when these three factors converge, a planning document, a legal framework and a ministry with its budget, the policy, the cultural policy is institutionalized. Uh, Hello, so in your book, you also study the role of intellectuals and artists in these policies. Yes, uh, by mobilizing the research in sociology of uh, social movements. So, as I said earlier, uh, intellectuals like Octavio Paz published open letters and petition to ask, first of all, uh, to put an end uh, to censorships to censorship and uh, ask for more public fundings uh, for, for culture. In Argentina, in the 80s, uh, the first mobilization of artists, in particular playwrights and filmmakers, was to stop censorship. 
just like in Mexico, artists and intellectuals formulate demands in political forums, including in think tanks, but also independently of parties. For example, uh, 10 years ago, artists, intellectuals and cultural managers have created the front of artists and cultural workers. The front organized many consultations in the all countries to write a bill called Federal Law of Cultures and to advocate for the creation of a Ministry of Culture. Another difference between the two countries is uh, the greater autonomy of cultural actors in Argentina. They are strong professional organizations that bring together writers such as Sade or Argentores from more than a century. Uh, those organizations give uh, prizes, scholarships, and organize solidarity among their members and function as a very effective pressure groups. It is interesting to note that in Argentina, intellectuals influence the policy from the outside. In Mexico, on the other end, it is common for intellectuals to have political career. Uh, Octavio Paz has been ambassador several times, or more recently, the novelist Jorge Volpi has held various positions in the administration of culture. Thank you, Henry. But in your book, you also analyze the process of change in these policies. Can you tell us more about this? Yes. Um, so actually, one of my assumptions uh, was that political changes impact cultural policy. Uh, three types of changes. Uh, first of all, large scale uh, political changes, uh, such as uh, paradigm shifts, including the, adapt the adoption uh, of the neoliberal uh, development models with monetarist economic policies have effects on policy direction and funding, but also political changeovers. Uh, for example, what were the effects of the election of the PAN in 2000 in Mexico after 80 years of the pre. I showed in the book uh, that these changes have effects on what I call philosophies of action. In other words, uh, their main objectives. For example, in Argentina with José Nú, culture was considered a factor of social inclusion. Whereas after the election of Mauricio Macri, culture was considered an economic resource just like when Menem was president in the 80s or Salinas in, in, in Mexico. So when you think uh, in this uh, way, investments in culture are, are made in the belief that the, uh, they have to create jobs and contribute to GPD. So uh, you will have more funds to creative and cultural industries uh, and this is to the detriment of uh, popular culture, for instance. I have explored this question uh, in depth in a collective uh, book on um, Ibero-American uh, cultural policies uh, published by Rudledge two years ago. And finally, uh, I wanted to measure the effects of the cultural policies on the cultural policies of the appointment of new minister of culture. Uh, here again, I could see that the less the policy is institutionalized, the more leeway the minister will have to do and undo what he or she wants. Uh, famous ministers uh, like uh, Pacho O'Donnell in Argentina or Rafael Tovari de Teresa in Mexico led more visible policies with uh, huge concerts in the street, for instance. I could call it a Jack Lang effect. Uh, so these are the three key concepts that I study around the processes of change. Macro social economic changes, uh, national political changes, and changes at the level of cultural policy leadership. Okay, thanks, uh, Elodie. My, my, my last question, please. You are talking about the decision makers. Can this book, beyond the research world, speak to them? Can you explain why this book is important for members of EULAC, for example? Yes, of course. Uh, the book can help decision makers outside uh, academia because it tells the making of a policy. 
It tells how a cultural policy uh, can consolidate or not, uh, and what are the key roles in the different types of action. Uh, the role of the intellectual, the artist, the decision maker, the pressure group, etc. This book uh, is also interesting for students who want to become cultural managers. Uh, I, as I was um, uh, selling earlier, uh, I um, um, supervise a master in cultural management in, uh, in France, and I train students who want to work in different cultural professions. And for them, it's uh, very important uh, to understand how a cultural policy um, function, how a cultural policy uh, uh, is made of. And a French version of the book was published uh, three years ago. So it can be interesting uh, uh, for uh, people uh, interest in cultural policy. But the book uh, can also speak more particularly, more particularly <laughs> sorry, to people working on heritage, uh, book and reading policies, uh, because there are subjects that I have uh, particularly analyzed uh, in this book. And of course, uh, for people working uh, with uh, Latin America, like uh, you like uh, uh, members. Uh, and I also use this book uh, to teach uh, my class uh, uh, cultural policy in, in Latin America. So um, it's a, an interesting book, I think. Emily, <laughs> uh, thanks uh, for your interesting uh, answers. And I think that your book is a very good contribution to cultural policy in Latin America. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much.